and welcome back to the Offspring Magazine, the podcast. It's Bea, and I will be hosting today's podcast. Today, we will talk to Professor Peter Zabiaga, who is one of the directors at the MPI of Colloids and Interfaces in the Department of Biomolecular Systems in Potsdam. Today's conversation will focus on Professor Zabiaga's research on carbohydrate-based vaccines. We go into detail about what carbohydrate-based vaccines are, how they work, and what is their potential. And we also talk in detail about the challenges of making carbohydrate-based vaccines. What does pharma really think about carbohydrate-based vaccines? The contributions Professor Sebega has made to the automated synthesis of carbohydrates and how this has advanced the field. So with that, I hope you will enjoy this episode. Thank you so much for uh, joining today. Why don't we just start, as per usual, with probably every interview that you do, just introduce yourself to the audience. Uh, my name is Peter Sieberger. Um, I'm a chemist and biochemist, and right now I'm a director of Max Planck Institute for Colloids Interfaces here in Potsdam. Nice. So what do you research? The focus of my research for the past well, 27 years now is sugars. Uh, my group works on carbohydrates, but not with short ones you put in a tea or coffee but we are more interested in the oligo and polysaccharides that surround um, all of the cells of humans, but also bacteria and parasites. Yeah, I mean, actually just walking around the Institute, I saw your research group is huge. So you have like a lot of different research groups, but one is focused on making carbohydrate-based vaccines. So our department here is um, a lot of younger people um, that work for the most part on their own. I um, so direct two research groups, so I have total of about uh, maybe 25 to 30 people and one is um, automation and one is called vaccines and that also basically goes to uh, the base of what we do. I think my claim to fame is basically the idea of using um, solid phase synthesis to make um, oligo and polysaccharides and that idea I actually had as a PhD student uh, because I got my PhD in the United States working for Marvin Carruthers. Marvin Carruthers developed the automated synthesis of DNA and of RNA. Yeah. And since we are three biopolymers that are basis of all of life, oligonucleotides store the um, genetic information by RNA that goes to peptides and proteins, and they then make in turn carbohydrates. And um, Bruce Merrifield in the 60s developed automated peptide synthesis. Um, Carruthers in the 80s and the 90s developed DNA and later on RNA synthesis. So as a PhD student, I realized, okay, there's a third one, and that's carbohydrates. And so I wanted to develop automated carbohydrates. And this is not knowing, but it's a lot more complicated. But basically now, 27 years later, uh, we realized, okay, this actually can be done. You can make really, really long structures. Uh, so you started off first with the idea of you want to have an automated system to make carbohydrates. Yeah. And then you kind of got into this field of carbohydrate-based vaccines. Exactly. So the idea was, if you can make a molecule, then there are things you can do afterwards. Yeah. The same was true in DNA too, right? If you can yeah. make a primer, you can do PCR. Um, so I think as a chemist, I realized that first of all, we got to make things. And um, as a PhD student, as I said, I realized that I wanted to make um, oligosaccharides. And what I did is I did a postdoc in the lab of Sam Benishevsky at the Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And at that time, five of us, five postdocs, would take two years to make a pentasaccharide, so five units. And the same actually is true even for DNA. Um, 40 years earlier, and for peptides, the same thing. So uh, what we realized is if you want to make it really something people can use, you got to come up with a way to make it faster. And so automation was the way we knew we had to go, but automation sounds just like you're going to whatever put together a machine, but by the end of the day, it comes down to chemistry, because you're going to have chemical reactions that work really, really well when yeah. you automate it. Uh, in DNA chemistry, for example, we get 99.99% yield for each a linkage in peptides similar and in carbohydrates we used to have yields of maybe 50 or 60 percent and of course we had to really study the glycosylation reaction get all that chemistry going get the protect groups better get the stereo um, stereochemistry right get the regio chemistry right put all that together and once the chemistry works then a machine can do it but one should not think that a machine can do something that doesn't work for humans okay so by machine by the end of the day is stupid it can only do repetitive things uh, and if those repetitive things work well 
then you can use it. So really starting in um, January 1st, 98, when I started my own group at MIT, what we looked at was like relation chemistry. And then luckily the first three years, we got things going so well that we could take our peptide synthesizer that we reconfigured. That's all we could afford at that time. We bought it used. Uh, we reconfigured it and the temperature change was done by a PhD student and me in the lab standing next to it and just maybe switching things around. That was a paper in science that sort of showed people, okay, it can be done. And then um, slowly, slowly we really innovated this entire process. And it was really each time we sort of clean up one bottleneck, a new bottleneck, I'm started and slowly, slowly can make larger structures. Today, we can make on a machine one go up to 100 mer. Uh, that's interesting for material science applications. And so one of the groups in my department today, Martina Zabianco, she has done a fantastic job in using the synthetic power to make new types of materials. So she can fold carbohydrates, she can create really cool um, structures. Um, other people in our department using that for, uh, in the past, have done it for plant carbohydrates. One of my colleagues now, Professor, in Vienna based on that. So basically, we looked at all this. And in my own group, what I've been interested in the, uh, from the beginning, basically, was to think about carbohydrate-based vaccines. Um, but what we realized is that automation is going to be key to get to actually um, solve this problem of carbohydrate-based vaccines. Because what's clear is carbohydrate-based vaccines have been around for a long time. They've been extremely successful. But for the next generation ones we're working on, the synthesis had to be brought under control. Okay. Oh, well, I don't even know where to start now. There are so many different yeah. questions. Um, but actually, so the first thing I wanted to ask was, how much did you learn from like a peptide synthesizer, DNA synthesizer, to then build your own machine? Because it seemed, I feel like to a non-chemist, maybe it sounds like, oh, it's kind of the same, but I could imagine that there were things that you learned and then things that maybe you had to reinvent from scratch. So we wanted to invent as little as possible. Yeah. Whatever we can take, we want to copy. So we looked, so what you need to make polymer synthesis, uh, Merrifield showed us that if you take a polystyrene resin, a little plastic bead basically, the little plastic bead um, sits on a, on a fritted funnel, so on a, on a filter basically, and all the stuff you don't want, you just wash away. Simple idea, mm -hmm. right? I mean, all the things you don't yeah. want, you wash away, all the stuff you want is on the bead. For that idea, he got a 1984 Nobel Prize, because in the 60s, that is what he figured out, and that changed the world of how to make peptides. So the beads that he has, the polystyrene, we use the same for carbohydrates. So we didn't have to change that, okay? Um, the linker, we had to change that. So that's the piece that connects the first sugar to the solid support. The yeah. sugar monomers that go on, those have been used in the solution phase chemistry, some of them, some things we had to develop new. The big difference between DNA, peptides, and carbohydrates is that both peptides and oligonucleotides, so DNA and RNA, uh, they are linear structures, mm. so there's no branching. In carbohydrates, you have branching, which means we have to put protecting groups in to allow for branching or, okay, in chemical terms, reach your chemistry. The second difference is that in uh, DNA and RNA, the linkage is, each linkage is not a new stereogenic center. So that means you have to control, you don't have to control that. And in carbohydrate chemistry, we, we have a new stereogenic center, which means you have to exercise um, stereo control. And from a chemical standpoint, which means we have to have two complicating factors. And that is why when I started, before I started as a postdoc, I talked to somebody at a meeting, this was 1996-97, I guess this will never work, this is a crazy idea, and you're wasting your time, and you're gonna have a, it's gonna be a total disaster. So luckily, it wasn't a disaster, I got tenure at MIT and we got to work on that, but it was not easy, it took a lot of time, and we had to really develop everything, but we learned where we could from DNA mm -hmm. um, and from peptides. The machines themselves, by the end of the day, the early machines, were, as I said, all peptide synthesizers because all it was basically a complicated syringe where you had more or less a, um, a device where you could put a bucket if you want, you could put stuff in. The difference in carbohydrates was we also had to adjust the temperature because DNA yeah. peptide chemistry is at ambient temperature, room temperature. We have to go to very low temperatures. And so we had to actually control the temperature, but all these things are not so difficult to build. But basically we took whatever was out there and adapted it to what we wanted. Yeah. But there were then quite a few people that said like, this is never gonna work. Cause like you said, it doesn't seem like a crazy, like innovative idea because you had peptide synthesizer, DNA synthesizer. It seems like That's the obvious the next step, That's why right? to me it was obvious, but I think most people said, the carbohydrate chemists at the time said, look, this is very difficult. This is only something for absolute total experts. Non-experts can never do that. Yeah. And I said, look, what we need is exactly the opposite. We wanna educate others to be able to do all these things um, and the only way you can do this is if we make it accessible to people. 
Um, and I think that is something we could show in the beginning. People said it can't be done. I was in the US at the time, I wrote an NIH grant, and the first grant I put in, uh, they said, oh, this can't be done, this is crazy, this won't work. So we got rejected. Then we showed the preliminary data, we had a science paper, we submitted yeah. the science paper, I said, look, they said, oh, no, it can't be done, no, I don't get funding anymore either. So we never <laughs> got funded on any of that stuff, and luckily I got funding for our project, so I was able to run my group at MIT and Google group, it was all good. But my actual core project, uh, the automated synthesis, never got funded. Uh, wow. Which was actually interesting. That was also one of the reasons when I had the offers to come back to Europe to go to ETH. I had the time to consider okay, my group was extremely well funded. I had 35 people at MIT, but I realized that if you want something really outside the box at that time, uh, it might be more easy the European uh, institution because you have a sort of base funding where you can yeah. do some of the risky projects and get additional funding on top. And of course, Max Planck Society, it's even better because there you get the money first. Then you better do something good. If you do something good, you get more money. And so I think that was one of the things I really appreciate about Max Planck Society of basically having this trust in people um, and being able to uh, complicate things. Yeah. What exactly does the machine do? Just if we want, if you could explain this to non chemists. Yeah. So you got to think about a machine. Uh, what it does, the entire process is basically you make sure you want to have a little uh, chain. Of, of beads, like almost pearls or a necklace or something, and each one of those little uh, pearls is a carbohydrate. So a carbohydrate has to be placed in a particular order, in a particular position. So what a machine does is has, in a little um, vial, it has the little beads, with the plastic beads, so that's where the whole pearl chain gets attached. Then the machine will take um, a dissolved building block of a particular carbohydrate, that you know, okay, that's the first one I wanna put in there, gets added, into a, a reaction vial, um, it waits until it reacts. What you want to have is stuck with a bead, the rest gets washed away. Then there is a so-called deprotection solution, which removes a so-called protective group that opens up one particular position, and you can have multiple positions. Like on my hand here, you can take one off, and that next one you can then attach it there. And so the machine goes through a cycle that basically consists of coupling, so putting the next sugar in, and from deprotection, which basically means opening up one side. And what all machine does. By the end of the day, the user has to tell the machine the order of building blocks, and that is something we are today also trying to automate, such at some point the machine can tell you, okay, that is what you should be doing. Mm. Today, that is still something the chemist has to say, okay, this is the order of building blocks, I'm going to do it, and basically tell the machine, okay, use building block five and eight and nine and whatnot. And I think eventually we'd like to have a sort of program that tells the user, okay, if you want to make this molecule, that's how you're gonna do it. That part is not yet automated. Okay, but we decide, so you you decide what um, building blocks get put together exactly. and in what order. Exactly. And you do that based on what you want the end, like exactly. the goal kind of, or the, yeah, what you want the molecule to do. Because probably if you put them in different orders, they'll have different functions, right? Exactly. And I think, but then, yeah. what, then, so then you want the machine to actually tell you what molecules you should be making. That is something that we would love in the end. The issue of carbohydrates is a little more complicated. As I said, carbohydrates are um, branched um, and we do not know how they fold. What we do know is carbohydrates also fold. Uh, there's okay. this whole dogma where people say carbohydrates don't fold. That is not true. Some carbohydrates don't fold and they do that because they have certain reasons why to do that. And the other things, for example, cellulose, um, that they form structures. So some of them will form helices and some others will also um, aggregate into fibrils. And that's why trees stand up outside, because yeah. actually we have cellulose fibers that come into play. And so currently what we are doing in, in my department here is we are very interested in trying to understand the very fundamentals as to how do carbohydrates fold, why do they um, assemble, and how they assemble in nature to make structures very important. Because if you think about it, trees can stand up over 100 meters tall in some cases for a very long time. Animal shells, chitin, mm -hmm. is also a carbohydrate. So these carbohydrates actually have structural roles. In other areas, for example, in virology, um, HIV virus on the surface has a lot of mannoses, another kind of carbohydrate, and those do not fold. And the reason is that they want to basically be almost like leaves in the wind, such that the immune system comes, it cannot actually uh, recognize the protein. So different carbohydrates have different functions, and based on different functions, will be different sequences. Yeah. And all that is something that we really like to understand. In DNA, people realized a long time ago how that works. In peptides also, and in carbohydrates, most of this is basically terra incognita, so unknown um, area. And this is what I really like to do. And the synthesizer, if you will, 
was only a tool to make the molecules available that can afterwards be used to open this entire area of carbohydrates. Just a fact. 80% of biopalm on Earth are carbohydrates. By oh, the way. Wow. No, because on, on half is on land. Um, that's cellulose and chitin and other things, yeah. right? And the other half is in the ocean. And this is something where we're going to go in the future now. We have first people now with Rudy Amman and Max Planck uh, in Bremen, uh, where we look actually at the carbohydrates in the ocean. Because 50% um, of the carbohydrates on Earth are in the ocean. They are not at all understood. We don't know exactly how they figure into the climate models. What's going to happen yeah. as uh, things warm? Are they going to release more CO2? Are they going to capture more? Are they going to be more active? So this is something totally unknown. All I'm trying to say is there are lots of areas in biology, material science, where carbohydrates play a role. And what we did is, I'm just a simple tool maker. I make tools for people that they can use them afterwards and study them. And for myself, I just picked vaccines as one thing I like to do. Mm. Yeah, yeah, no, makes sense. Um, in the machine, you talked about like building blocks being put together. These building blocks, are they carbohydrates that are put together? Or is it like a monosaccharide? They are monosaccharides. So we, have, we usually use monosaccharides. You can also use larger ones if you like. Yeah. But the question is, um, we have done what we call block couplings to put larger ones together, but we usually don't do that on a synthesizer. You might just do that after the synthesis. Yeah. But in principle, we can also do that. But typically, you want to have it broken down as much as possible so you don't have to make oligos. Today, of course, some of my students started a company that is actually offering uh, offering the building blocks today um, because the building blocks take a lot of time to make. And if a company can offer that, of course, that makes a life for PhD students and postdocs um, easier. And then it's one of those things. Um, in the beginning, it's expensive because few people use it. But as more people use it, the, the building blocks get uh, cheaper. And I'll give you an example from DNA chemistry. When I started my PhD in 1990, one gram of uh, building block in DNA used to cost $100. And today, a gram is, I think, it's less than $3. <laughs> in today's dollars, okay, which is even, even less yeah. expensive than this, right? But what it shows is if a lot of people use it, um, the price goes down because it's just economy of scale, basically. And in carbohydrates, yeah. we're a little bit early um, in that in that range. So prices are still quite expensive, but it's still cheaper now to buy it than having PhD students and postdocs spending weeks or months making building blocks because yeah. that scientifically also not very attractive. Yeah, yeah. Could you build a machine to make these building blocks? No, right now not. Very clearly. Okay. Unfortunately not. Okay, so that, that would be really <laughs> cool if you could combine two machines, one to make the monosaccharides or building blocks and the other one to put them together. So we are developing some flow chemistry devices and flow chemistry is one way how to scale certain things cheaper uh, in the area of carbohydrates. Uh, but unfortunately, no. That would be really nice, yeah. Okay. The other thing, of course, we gotta say at some point, maybe down the road, there may be um, enzymatic systems to make oligosaccharides. Some people, some people work on that. Some people see this as a competition for us. I personally don't think so because um, I think there will always gonna be a use for making um, synthetic molecules because we can, of course, make atomic changes. We can put non-natural yeah. uh, fluorine or something into certain places. Others cannot do that. And I think if somebody can do it enzymatically and make it cheaper, hey, fantastic, okay. Um, so I think one shouldn't shouldn't play at least two against each other. I think they're both complementary. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I think a lot of science like has to be complementary as well. Otherwise, yeah. progression will just happen so slowly, and that's essentially that's not what anyone wants. Um, okay, let's maybe talk a little bit about vaccines. Yeah. So I guess we've described what a carbohydrate is because it's just monosaccharides that are put together to form a larger structure. Um, what are vaccines and how do they work? So vaccines in general, the idea is very simple. You're going to somehow teach your body to recognize an invader uh, that's foreign to your body and maybe causes harm. But invader could be a bacterium, it could be a virus, it could be a parasite. And so what you're going to do is you're going to somehow teach your body to recognize it. How do you recognize uh, somebody else? Usually on the outside, right? Um, how do you recognize an invader? We got to look at the outside. So the outside of um, cells are carbohydrates, the so-called glycocalyx, that's around every cell, and proteins. Um, and so many vaccines are based on proteins. Um, that's quite common, many of them are commercial. And the second idea was to use carbohydrates as vaccine. To basically say, look, human body, let's make an immune response with the antibodies that can recognize the carbohydrates on the surface of bacteria. So in the 19, uh, late 1920s and late 19, early 1930s, groups in the United States looked at actually trying to create the first carbohydrate-based vaccines. Sorry, when was that? 1920s and 1930s. Wow. So 100 years ago. Wow. 
Okay. So the idea was where they is okay, carbohydrates are on these different bacteria. Um, and can we make a male use them? Just to put it into perspective, when was the first vaccine created? What year? Well, a long time ago in China and India. And then there was uh, Jenner, the um, American and British doctor, who used it for, for smallpox, right? Yeah. This is, I think, late um, 18th century or something, early 19th century. But what they did is they used usually what's called light vaccines, right? For smallpox, uh, yeah, they, used, they used cowpox. Yeah. And, and that's what they did in India and China even for a longer time before that. Uh, they, used, they would do that. And basically the idea was that on the surface of these um, non-lethal um, 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 infectious agents, there would be things that would also protect against something harmful. So cowpox, yeah. which are not bad for us, they would protect you from, from, from smallpox, which would be hard for us. So that was the idea. Eventually people said, okay, let's go to heat kill vaccines. So um, you can have either live weekend vaccines, attenuated vaccines, or you can have uh, killed vaccines. But the idea was always the same. Give a human body something that will stimulate and make immune response, but not resolve the disease. So either something that's not harmful to us, something that's weakened, or something that's killed. Yeah. But the next level that you're going to go to is, okay, can we make a synthetic vaccine? Can we take something that is actually either genetic material, or is it a, is it a peptide, or is it a carbohydrate that you can give? And again, that is something, of course, in a peptide field, was much easier to do because from the 60s on, Mary Field showed us how to make peptide, yeah. and so people could think about using peptides. In the carbohydrate field, everything developed using isolate material. So starting in the 30s, then 40s, the first experiments in humans came in the 1940s after the Second World War, and mainly in soldiers. People realized that um, maybe one can experiment using dead bacteria. So if you think about a bacterium, cell, on the cell surface there is a particular carbohydrate, so-called um, capsular polysaccharide in many cases, and these sugars, these complex carbohydrates, they are specific to a particular type of bacterium, even to a particular strain. They are also different on human cells. For example, a cancer cell will have a different carbohydrate from a healthy cell, huh. which of course gets you a lot of interest because you can say, okay, I vaccinate people against cancer. And this is why my postdoc at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, because this is when they already start mm -hmm. thinking about this in the 90s, okay? So we're talking about not 25 years yeah, yeah, ago. Yeah. So, but let's, let's talk about bacteria for now. Yeah, we'll talk exactly. about cancer yeah, after. Exactly. And so, uh, basically, what happened then in the 60s, 70s, um, and so on, people said, okay, let's try to make an immune response in humans. And for that purpose, we're going to do is we're going to grow bacteria. We're going um, to we're gonna take the polysaccharide from the surface and isolate that. That sounds really simple, right? Yeah. Um, nah, some bacteria don't like to grow, right? So that's the first problem. Yeah. Some don't like to grow, others don't like to necessarily make it so easy for you to actually purify the carbohydrates. Some carbohydrates are not super stable, so there are all these issues. But that was more or less a situation in the 60s. People realized, okay, we can take a polysaccharide, so just the carbohydrate from bacterium, I can inject it, um, and in you and in me, we're okay. The problem is what they realized is that carbohydrates are not really immunogenic in small children under the age of two. Okay. And they are not really immunogenic in people above about 65, 70. Why is that? So the reason is probably that carbohydrates play a very important role during development. So during embryonal mm -hmm. development, there are carbohydrates that sort of make sure that certain cells go to certain parts of your body. And um, so it would be not really advantageous if you make good immune response against carbohydrates. And so okay. in small children, that, that's one explanation, okay? I so, was act that was actually one of my questions because I read online that the immune response um, for antibiotics is weaker, but especially it's weaker for like children yeah. under the age of, well, you uh, said two, yeah. and then for immunocompromise and the elderly yeah. as well. The elderly is clear because the immune, system goes down. the immune system in the elderly goes down as we're aging, our immune system yeah. becomes less efficient. So I think that is to be expected. Immunocompromise, same situation, right? You have to recognize that. Yeah. Now, um, what do people realize then is that. Um, what you really want is a T cell dependent response, and um, carbohydrates are truly not T cell epitopes. So, what you do need is you need a piece of, of protein or peptide. Mm -hmm. And what they then did is they made so called um, conjugate vaccines. And I say they, this is typically pharmaceutical companies from about the 1980s on. People started to look into that. So, in the 60s, already polysaccharides started to occur, but then they started to have a so called conjugate vaccine. So, the idea was to say, okay, let's take a protein. But it's going to be recognized by the immune system. It's going to lead to a very strong immune response. But on that, we chemically conjugate a carbohydrate. 
and the immune system is going to see chopped pieces of protein plus carbohydrates and it's going to make an immune response against the protein but also against the carbohydrate. So okay. what they did is as carriers they used at that time diphtheria toxoid or tetanus toxoid and diphtheria and tetanus are vaccines which we are getting as kids already yeah. and so you're basically giving that one more time but in this case with a carbohydrate your body recognizes that makes a strong immune response and also it's going to protect against the carbohydrate. And this is um, now on a market since the 1990s. The first vaccine uh, in humans to be used was against Haemophilus influenza type B. It's a mouthful. We call it HIP, HIV. And uh, Haemophilus influenza type B used to kill millions of children every year. Um, very, very uh, big problem. Ever since this vaccine is being used, and it's unfortunately today used not in all countries, in many countries, but it's relatively expensive. Um, in most countries that use the vaccine in children, they basically see no more deaths, it's completely gone. And in, in develop, developing countries that don't use the vaccine, the, um, yeah, it's still a problem. It's still a problem. It's um, a problem. What is this against? You said influenza? Hemophilus, it's called, it's a bacterium, it's called Haemophilus influenza oh. type E. So influenza is... It has not, of, that confuses me because I'm like, influenza is a virus. No, so. no, no. no well, here we're talking about it's a bacteria. A, it's, it's a bacterium, but the name of a bacterium is called Haemophilus okay. influenza type E. It's complicated, right? We yeah. Have, we have uh, Haemophilus, we have Streptococcus, we have different types of bacteria. Yeah. That's a bacterium. So okay. bacterial okay, okay. with a carbohydrate on top, okay? So that was the first one in the 90s. Even to this day, these are blockbuster vaccines. They still sell over a billion uh, in revenue each year. Our kids get it. It's great, okay? What we have to do in the future is we have to make sure that more kids get it. Part of the problem is that the current vaccine is a little bit labile. It's not very heat stable. The carbohydrate can degrade. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the reasons because the cold chains can be problematic. So we're working on solutions, chemical solutions actually uh, to this problem, which we I think we have solved now. But in the mid 90s, when came a wave of conjugate vaccines against um, lung disease, against pneumococci. So streptococcus pneumonia is um, the leading cause um, of death, actually it kills more children in Africa uh, than malaria oh, wow. um, and HIV. So that's um, pretty serious. Yeah. It kills a lot of old people in developed countries. And um, there was a product that came out in the mid 2000s by um, about two companies had vaccines. One was Pfizer that had Prevnar and one was Synflorex by um, GSK and um, these vaccines became very famous during the COVID pandemic again because many COVID patients did not actually die from COVID, they actually mm. died from a bacteria because what happens is your immune system is well, you're, you're, you're under attack basically, right? And then these bacteria grow up and then the bacteria will kill you. So this is why many people get vaccinated and the companies that made that, those, they had uh, revenues for just these vaccines in excess of 6 billion per year. Um, so these are very, very large markets. So what it show, and that's important because I think for a long time people in the vaccine field said, yeah, um, vaccines are great, they save a lot of lives, but they make no money for the companies. And if the companies cannot recoup their very, very high development cost, then nobody would develop anything. And because of the Prevna franchise for Pfizer, that made so much money, I think it became clear to people is okay, vaccines can be good business. And uh, by the end of the day, I think that's good because that means more vaccines are being developed more people have been protected, and I think that's what we want. Yeah, yeah, 100%. So the issue of Prevnar is, however, um, that there are at least 95 serotypes. So they are basically the streptococcus pneumonia, but then there are these different types. And the different types have different carbohydrates on the surface. Mm -hmm. So Prevnar, the first one, um, was, a, was a smaller one. Um, Prevnar, um, seven then came out and then Prevnar 13 with 13 serotypes and that's what's used today and right now they're gonna go to 20 serotypes. But each time you are putting that vaccine in then what happens is the, the bacteria hang in your nasopharynx so basically around your nose um, and in the uh, vicinity. But what you do is you basically need to make sure that those serotypes don't kill people anymore. But these other remaining 80 plus serotypes say hey, fantastic more space for us so let's go in we call that scientifically serotype replacement. <laughs> And because of serotype replacement, there's always a need to develop new vaccines in this area. And um, as I said earlier, some of the carbohydrates don't like to be purified. Um, it's a very expensive process. It's a very lengthy process. I think the production of Prevnar is the most complicated drug development process because they have to purify basically before 13. Now they're going to have to purify 20 different carbohydrates. Production is super expensive. And what we said is, how about if you could just make that antigen, that piece of carbohydrate that we need to mimic the cell surface, we can make that synthetic. 
And people said, okay, but synthetic is going to be expensive. Um, it's going to be hard. And it was hard beforehand. But because we were able to automate our process, we yeah. made it faster, all of a sudden we could say, look, um, the discovery process, that you don't just make one, but you make many, many different molecules, used to take so much time. And now all of a sudden we can make this much faster, we can accelerate this drug discovery process, and we can really screen much faster. And that is why our tool of automatic like an assembly was the basis of what could be done um, afterwards from a vaccine standpoint. So the first thing was that people said, okay, it's gonna take too long. The second thing they said to us is, okay, synthetic is expensive, isolation is cheap. And that turns out to not be true because you need so little for a vaccine. In order to vaccinate you, I would need about five micrograms, five yeah. micrograms, actually even less, four micrograms, um, two baby per dose. And uh, even if the carbohydrate itself is relatively expensive to make, the amount you need is so little yeah. that today the cost of goods of just for carbohydrate is below 10 cents. Okay, that's not a vaccine, right? That's just part of a vaccine. Yeah. But that means a vaccine that you can sell for multiple dollars or euros, um, if you are below 10 cents, it, it doesn't matter, okay? Um, so that is why today we even think about developing vaccines for animals. Uh, because they're so cheap that even in animals, it would make sense. Uh, and some yeah, because I always heard that like um, vaccines for animals, it's not a big market because animals don't require that many vaccines in a lot of times. Like the vaccines that you use in humans, you can also just use in animals. So why develop different ones? Right. The, the problem is that some of the animals have different um, diseases. For example, yeah. Streptococcus in, in humans is called Streptococcus pneumoniae. Yeah. In, the, in pigs, it's called Streptococcus suis, not the pigs, Streptococcus suis, and the carbohydrates on the surface of these bacteria are totally different. Uh, so okay. if you want to use a human vaccine, good luck because it's not the same. Yeah. So actually we just published papers last year where we showed that we were actually able to make also uh, the pig vaccines. In principle, that's something that's going to actually go into the patients, um, I think, this month uh, now. And uh, the advantage there is that you don't have to do a lot of animal trials. You can actually go directly into the, into yeah. the animals uh, that you go into. Uh, for a pig, a vaccine can cost you about a euro, I would say. Uh, then it still makes sense. Uh, for chickens, that's one thing we can't do anything. For chickens, we got to go below one cent, and that's impossible. The reason I'm excited about animal vaccines is that we often forget the fact that we're using so many antibiotics in these farms. And uh, the antibiotics we use, the chances that they're going to become resistant, it's going to go over to humans. And if you think of one, <clears throat> one health idea of humans, animals being all in the same place, I think that it makes sense to use vaccines. And that's 100%. something that you don't just go. That's to. actually really cool. Um, I did a podcast about antibiotic resistance about like a couple of months ago. And we specifically spoke about the fact that so many antibiotics are being used in factory farms. So if we can develop vaccines that. Yes, yeah. I think it's cool. Actually, one thing that I would love to do is also fish vaccines, right? Because yeah. I don't know if you know that, but I think the Gulf of Mexico, they're dumping actually antibiotics with the shovels into the ocean. Oh, no, into I this farm. So it's, really, it's, it's quite disgusting. Um, so I think one of the things is really to, to try to go and, and bring that out. For us, um, we developed, of course, first for humans we were working on. The very first things I worked on myself was Leishmania, uh, the parasite, and uh, malaria. Um, and what we realized is malaria is a very difficult field. Um, so we, we got out of this because it's just very, very yeah. difficult from a development standpoint because you're talking about a very complicated uh, parasite, but also in a developing world, which is something that's very, very hard uh, to deal with. And then we realized that for vaccines, you have to focus probably on markets. Now, there's a market in the first world because otherwise people are a little bit reluctant to develop it because they really worry about recouping their investments. Yeah. Because the clinical trials to run for vaccines, I think the Prevna vaccine, uh, trial the original ones were 40,000 patients. So these are really, yeah. really huge investments and makes sense that companies want to make money back, right? So I think yeah. that's clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I worry about with the animal vaccines that like there's not going to be that much uh, incentive for a company to develop a vaccine. Oh, all these vaccine animal. companies, actually, animal vaccine companies, there are some good ones in Germany. Uh, there's one actually close uh, close to, to Berlin in Sachsen Anhalt uh, called IDT, a, a German vaccine company. Yeah. And I think it's very important and it's going to become even more important as antibiotic resistance is growing because I think if we want to get out of this abuse of antibiotics, yeah. vaccines is the only alternative we have. And I think the other thing, of course, is the area of, of companion pets, mm -hmm. cats and dogs. Um, there are possibilities we are going there. But for me, it was clear I would like to work on humans, right? So we worked yeah. on more or less um, any of the nasties. If you go down the World Health Organization list of, of nasty bacteria, uh, we worked on all of them. And um, at Max Planck, of course, a good thing is that in my department we have everything covered from the um, 
synthesis, the engineering to make machines, mm. to make molecules, to test the molecules. I have biochemists, immunologists working for me. We have access to ammo facilities um, ourselves here, so we can actually go up to um, safety level two uh, to test this. So we have really everything in one hand, it makes it so much easier. So what we established already over 10 years ago is that we can go very quickly from a synthesis to testing in animals. Yeah. And we can publish very nice papers. The problem was that we really wanted to go to the next level and actually test this um, in humans and, and develop it for use. And that was something within Max Planck, that's not our mission, okay? And that's not what we're supposed to do. Yeah. But some of my um, group leaders, postdocs, PhD students, uh, they started a company uh, called Vaxilon. And in 2015, um, they got 30 million euros uh, to set up this company, which was based out of Switzerland, with research facilities here in Berlin. And they were so successful that uh, five years later, uh, they sold the company to a company called Idorsia, a very large Swiss company. Mm -hmm. And they have now two of their candidates um, going to human clinical trial. And one is for Clostridium difficile, and the other one for Clostridium pneumonia. Uh, Clostridium difficile is an uh, um, intestinal uh, problem, and uh, Clostridium yeah. pneumonia is also a, a lung uh, thing. So I'm very happy they pushed this forward. So they really showed that this can go to uh, human clinical trials, also create a lot of uh, high paying jobs in Germany. Yeah. I think that showed directly that the investment in science sometimes will directly pays off that some money uh, flows. Yeah. Again, that's another message I like to always mention to people. Look, yes, Max Planck, we are doing very basic research. I'm interested in glycosylations and carbohydrates. Uh, but by the end of the day, this may at some point um, yield to the creation of, of, of value and thereby um, a return of investment also to the taxpayers. Mm. It seems like there's a lot of vaccines in clinical trials right now. How many carbohydrate-based vaccines are actually on the market? On the market today, there are um, three um, vaccines on the market, but they are none of them are synthetic. So they are all based on ah, so so none of the things that I developed on the market. I mean, to get a market, it takes about 15 years. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we showed this to companies as early as 2005, 2006. And at that time, the company said, oh, we've always done it by isolation, so we're not going to change that. People are very conservative in the vaccine field for good reason, because they're yeah. too healthy, small children. So we really want to make sure we don't mess anything up. Um, I think the last few years now people have realized, okay, you may be reaching the limits as to what we can do. We are right now discussing with large pharmaceutical companies to go back. Again, there's a lot of talk also about, of course, from the mRNA vaccines, um, which different carbohydrate vaccines, but there are certain aspects of carbohydrates that also uh, work in that direction. But I think through the COVID pandemic, the whole idea of vaccines are beneficial and uh, they are something worthwhile to actually put money in. That is benefited the field, it's also benefited us. Yeah, against COVID though, I just wanted to make this clear, oh, we wouldn't nothing, be able no. to develop a carbohydrate-based no. vaccine. I think the issue is that most uh, viruses, they use a human machinery, so they use a gly human glycosylation pattern. If you use a human glycosylation pattern, then you have self. Yeah. And if you would create a uh, response against carbohydrates that also are on humans, then you have autoimmune disease, because you're attacking uh, the body, right? Yeah. So I think this is one of the challenges uh, for viruses, and the second challenge is in the area of cancer, because cancer, of course, also is human cells. And if they have the yeah. same carbohydrates as a healthy cell, then you could have a problem. Yeah, but you said that cancer cells have different carbohydrates. Different, yes. Uh, but they're not, I mean, bacteria, from that perspective, they're really very different. They use yeah. different monosaccharides, they use different linkages, they use different phosphorylation and sulfation, so they're very different. Um, the kinds of carbohydrates found on cancer cells they use only the 10 different monosaccharides found in humans. They use the same sort of um, patterns, mm. and they're oftentimes quite close to what we have on our own cells. Okay. And so people have looked into that um, starting in the mid-1990s, the group where I was a postdoc, plus some people at the time, and there was actually a um, vaccine trial, phase three, so very late stage clinical trial for breast cancer um, in women in Taiwan and uh, the company failed because of that. Uh, they, they had only 50% response, but if you think about it, it was actually quite a good result um, because that result showed that those 50% of people that did make antibodies were actually protected from recurrent uh, breast cancer. And um, in cancer patients, it is my opinion that maybe one should not go with active vaccination, where we're actually gonna give the carbohydrate but rather with passive vaccination, where you're going to make an antibody and then mm. actually give that antibody uh, to a patient. So the, the patient has to make the antibody themselves. They get a they humanized get um, antibody and use that. And I have to say, that idea led to another company that came out of my uh, department here because 
it became quite obvious that we you know how to make carbohydrates. We also know how to raise antibodies against carbohydrates. And once that became clear, the investors said, okay, this is something we like to do. And there's a company also in Berlin that called Pakalix that basically um, develops uh, humanized um, antibodies against carbohydrates, trying to treat um, cancers. Oh, so you develop the antibodies like in a lab? In the lab, yeah. So basically what we do is we have, I can say this now, so in my, in my department here, we are just the basic things, right? So we have made antibodies all along as research tools. Yeah. So we used to go to mice and rabbits and rats, um, and eventually we went to alpacas. So oh. uh, actually there's alpaca herd in Brandenburg, oh. and I can tell this because nothing bad happens to the animals, okay? They had a petting zoo, and uh, they get an injection, and they, they make antibodies, and when you breathe them, they don't like that too much, but it doesn't yeah. matter, they like us, right? We just get blood drawn. Um, and uh, use alpacas because alpacas, um, and there's also groups Max Planck who work on that, they make a single chain antibody. So usually uh -huh. you have these, these Y-shaped antibodies and um, alpacas and sharks are using, um, make different types. So that's very well known. There have been many companies in Belgium set up on this by the developers, but nobody had made it against carbohydrates. So we said, okay, let's try to do this against carbohydrates. To make the antibodies, you need the substrates. The substrates you can make chemically. We know how to do it chemically, yeah. so I make the substrate. We use it, we go in animals. And so you inject like the carbohydrate. The carbohydrate, a conjugate actually. Oh, it's, a it's, a like a, it's not like a conjugate vaccine. So oh, basically okay. you do that. Okay. Uh, then we also search for antibodies that may already be in the animal. And we have done this now in chicken. We have done it in frogs. Uh, yeah. One of my crew wanted to do it in sharks, but getting sharks, it's, it's a little Ooh. expensive, okay? I mean, yeah. shark tanks where you are. But um, the reason is that these different animals have different immune responses. And so yeah. we just wanted to see um, the immune responses, so we learn a lot of basic immunology, and in addition to that, you make antibodies which could be actually quite useful for diagnosis of cancer, but also for the treatment of cancer. Okay, so right now you're not, you don't think that any carbohydrate-based vaccines will actually be useful in cancer. Yeah. Um, so for me personally, I th it makes me nervous. It doesn't make me nervous about bacteria because I know the structures are totally different. Yeah. But if I would take a carbohydrate that is on our regular cells. I make that and I somehow get your body to make an immune response on my body uh, to that, which would be hard, but there's mm. certain ways of using sort of stimulation to do that. Then that immune response would recognize all parts of the body where this carbohydrate is expressed. And if that's on your brain, you make an immune response against the brain, and I don't think I want that, right? I think in cancer patients, you may say, okay, if it's a patient, that's one thing, but a vaccine that would prevent the occurrence of cancer, you would go into healthy people. I think that is yeah. very difficult. And if you talk about cancer vaccines today, we are talking for the most part not about a vaccine that's given to healthy people, but we're giving to somebody who may have had a cancer. Yeah. That the um, initial cancer was um, removed by uh, surgery, for example, and then you give a vaccine with the idea to prevent any remaining cells from metastasizing somewhere else or, or trying to reoccur. I think that's really the idea. So I think in patients, you may say, okay, we might be able to use such vaccines. I personally am very nervous about it because we don't know enough today what other parts of your body is this particular carbohydrate expressed. What we learn now from our antibody studies, the antibodies we made, we're going now into organ screening. We say, okay, let's just take different slices from different uh, human organs and let's see if we can find these glycan structures on other parts of the body. And again, this is an area that's not really known because mm -hmm. if it would be clear that a carbohydrate is only in a cancer and not at all, on healthy cells. I think maybe okay. We don't know that. We don't know if it's black yeah. or white, right? It may just yeah. be gray and it may be really high on cancers and really low on some other cells, but maybe some cells it's a little higher and then it becomes it becomes tricky, yeah. right? Be, but data is just not at that stage. And that's data that's being developed in my department today, but also in some in the company that works on that. Yeah, okay, so there's just a lot more potential right now to treat, uh, to use these carbohydrate-based vaccines against bacteria. It's just easier because the bacteria yeah. are so different, right? I mean, that's yeah. very clear. If you make that carbohydrate, nothing bad will happen to your body. You will have no, um, no um, Ill side effects. And actually, that's interesting. Um, you don't see many side effects in these in these conjugate vaccines. I think they're really safe. I, okay. I didn't make them. Compared, else compared them. to like protein-based vaccines, that's or all, that's all vaccines what we hear about, right? I okay. mean, I think. Yeah. Um, so I think they're very safe. And the other thing that's interesting, there is no resistance building up, because for protein-based vaccines, mm -hmm. we hear that sometimes resistance builds up. Yeah. Because if whatever the, um, the infectious agent is, if it changes this amino acid sequence, it can change its protein, right? By just changing one, yeah. one thing. In carbohydrates, uh, the advantage is it's not in a direct genetic control because the carbohydrate is made by a whole bunch of, of enzymes. So if a body changes, and let's say a bacterium switches off some transferase, 
mm-hmm. man all of a sudden it doesn't make its polysaccharide coat anymore it doesn't make its polysaccharide coat anymore it's not protected because these polysaccharide coats around it actually protect the the, mm-hmm. the, the infectious agent yeah. so if it if it gets too much uh, changed all of a sudden it messes things up so that's why so far nobody has seen any resistance to to carbonated vaccines and that's a big yeah. advantage of course yeah well this is a fascinating field because i have to say i'm going to be i'm going to admit this but i didn't actually know carbohydrate based vaccines were a real thing mm-hmm. like i had heard that people were trying to build va- uh, to make vaccines against bacteria mm-hmm. Um, but I had never realized that it was carbohydrate-based vaccines that we were using. It's interesting when you say synthetic and non-synthetic, how now most of them are non-synthetic, all of them are actually. When we talk about synthetic vaccines, do you think that we could kind of do some like functionalization or modification on the carbohydrate to help improve the immune response? So immune response is one thing, of course, because it sounds more foreign and there are actually groups around the world to do exactly that now. Ah. But look into this, uh, one of my former co-workers at the University of Münster, they are putting fluorines in, in yeah. some places just to make it uh, more unnatural. Uh, so I think that's so immunogenicity can be strengthened. The second thing that's interesting um, is you can actually make certain carbohydrates more stable. For example, Haemophilus influenza type B hip, one I mentioned earlier. The problem is that um, there is in one particular place, there is hydroxyl group, um, and if you take the OH away, so if you take the, the hydrogen away and deprotonate, um, it attacks itself and cleaves. The problem is when you formulate that vaccine, you're using basic aluminum. Mm-hmm. So if you take basic aluminum plus something uh, that's acidic, you bring this together, it cleaves itself. So the vaccine is not very stable. As a chemist, of course, we know we can just change that OH group to something else. Yeah. And this is exactly what we did at Max Planck some years ago, and we patented that also. And right now, actually, we are in the process of collaborating with a pharmaceutical company that is interested because if you're able um, to actually make this um, carbohydrate stable for a long time, then all of a sudden it's much easier to ship it, it's easier to keep it with doctors, it's easier to deliver it even at higher temperature. And the one that we, that's usually given has to be kept at four degrees as it's stable for a very short time. The one we made chemically, you can keep it seven degrees for two, three months. And nothing happens yeah. and that makes it a little bit easier because to be your problem in developing countries is, is the cold chain the cold chain is about 50 percent of the cost and it's the last mile really getting it to the people um that gonna give it and if we can make things more stable less dependent on cold chain i think that's good and i think that is some of the things where i see modifying carbohydrates um is a really advantage it's not necessarily for all carbohydrates but it's necessary for some carbohydrates i definitely see potential in in that oh, probably as a chemist, but I would assume also that pharmaceutical companies will will be adopting that strategy. Because if you can make if you can make a vaccine more stable, why would you still not be going synthetic? Yeah, I think one of the issues is that in the, tra- the traditional vaccinology in pharmaceutical companies has not been one of synthesis. It's always mm-hmm. been an idea of isolation or attenuated um, vaccines, others. So the people who run the vaccine units are typically not chemists. And so I think what we realized is when we first showed that, people said, like, oh, we have never done it right away, so why should we do it in the future? And there's a second aspect. Um, the vaccines we use today are biologics. So the uh, patents usually re- revolve around uh, processes um, and process patents. What we could yeah. do is we could make, of course, a composition of matter patent to say, okay, that is exactly what you patent, which is the great advantages, you really own that. The disadvantages, that after the, um, the patent stops, you'll be open for genetics because anybody can make it chemically. Yeah. But the processes for some of the vaccines that are used as biologics are so complicated that even if they are off patent, nobody can actually repeat that yeah. process because the company that developed it has done such a good job that it's really hard to do. Yeah. And I think the chemistry would be much simpler. And of course, I mean, there are different reasons to say, okay, we might do it or we might not do it, but I see particularly a chance of synthetics in the uh, developing world. Because in that case, you could say, okay, if you could enable people in uh, different parts of the world to make their own vaccines at a low cost, as I said, quite inexpensive in some cases, that would mean there would be more vaccine available. I think by the end of the day, that's really uh, what you go, all you want. And I guess in children as well, right? Because then hopefully you can get generate a stronger, or elderly people as well, because then you can generate a stronger exactly. immune response. So I, think, I don't think that synthetic vaccines are a solution to all our problems. I think yeah, that's yeah. lots of stuff. What I would just say is, look, let's keep an open mind. Let's not just focus on biologics, they've been very good to us, but the next generation could be synthetic, can be synthetic. And in some cases you may have vaccines that will be partially biologics because they, they grow great, you can isolate them great, 
and um, some of it might be synthetic. Because Prevna, for example, there are in the old uh, the current vaccine 13 serotypes. And if you go to next generation vaccines, maybe as well as 13 that you isolated, and then maybe another 15 that came synthetic, and you combine that to have better coverage. I think that's where we're we going to go in the future. Yeah. Is there a benefit of just having like a synthetic carbohydrate with a strong immune response versus like a conjugate vaccine? No, I think the synthetic carbohydrates are also used as conjugates. So ah, again, they use always... again as conjugates oh. because they are smaller, so they themselves are not. So they again conjugates. I should, however, say that at Max Planck ten years ago, we we showed in a study that you don't have to use uh, proteins to do that. We were able to show that you can use a glycolipid. Mm -hmm. There are certain glycolipids that are um, that are inducing strong immune responses. Also, those are of course not proteins anymore, which means you don't have to cool them. Yeah. Um, they go via different pathways, INKT cells, okay, different uh, pathway you can go, so very, very interesting immunologically. And what we can do is we can make completely synthetic vaccines, which have a synthetic carbohydrate plus a synthetic um, carrier, and that you can leave at room temperature. And I can tell you, we talked to the um, regulatory authorities in Germany, and they got very excited about this, said, you should really mm -hmm. test this, but then you go to companies, of course, the regulatory actually gets very excited. That means there's lots of experiments to be done. So this is why typically vaccine companies try to deviate as little as possible, Yeah, which makes sense actually from what's already in humans, because if you have already vaccines in, I don't know, Prevna in billions of people and it's safe, the chances, if you make one small change, you're gonna just look at that small change. If I'm saying, look, it's all off the table, I'm gonna start completely new, then you're gonna do lots of clinical trials yeah. with many people for good reason, right? Yeah, but on a theoretical level, there's absolutely, like, there's no difference with what kind of linker you use. And there's no downside of using a conjugate vaccine versus a purely oh, carbohydrate-based vaccine. Literally, I think by the end of the day, uh, if you heal or if you protect, that's what, what counts by the end yeah. of the day. But again, I think we have to always distinguish a vaccine area from a treatment area that we are dealing with healthy mm. children in many cases and there's absolutely zero tolerance for any kind of side effects. And yeah. that's for clinical trials. It's different, with, let's say, a, a cancer um, agent where you see it's a very sick person that um, benefits in any case if you have if you have a, an upside, right? In yeah. a vaccine against a bacteria in a newborn, there is no room for any sort of side effects. Yeah. We've painted a really beautiful picture of carbohydrate-based vaccines, but what would be some of the downsides or some of the challenges that still need to be overcome? Um, <clears throat> I think, excuse <clears throat> me, today what we have is um, a situation where we <clears throat> Sorry. So today we have a situation where carbohydrate-based vaccines have a lot of potential, a lot of promise as we pointed out. We see no downsides right now. I think the downsides oh. may at some point come once we develop things. I think the yeah. challenge for us was really one of industrial uptake. Do people really want to test that? So this is at some point we were able to show this on 10, 15 different um, pathogens, uh, but still we didn't get it forward. That's why we talked to many companies from 2005 to 2015, and people didn't want to develop in the vaccine companies. And that's why eventually we were lucky to actually raise some money to start our own company to do this, because that's the only way of how actually one could advance this. And I think now looking at the clinical trials and once these data get available, then maybe more people will be interested because I think mm -hmm. it's one thing to publish an academic paper, and that's all very good, right? You get a nice PhD, but for a vaccine, mm -hmm. by the end of the day, you have to have this in humans, you have to show it works. And I'm very hopeful that it's actually going to happen over the next couple of years. I think once that happens and people say, okay, that's an alternative, let's use that. And then we'll see that in many areas it will work, and other areas it may not work, okay? But I think that's something that will then um, uh, show. But I think we, should, we basically have now the tools available to do that. It was 15 years, 20 years ago, the tools weren't available, the knowledge wasn't there. Now both the knowledge and the tools are there for people to use. And what all we hope to do is to convince people, look, this is something worthwhile. Let's look into this, let's move this forward, but let's also not forget the investment in developing a vaccine, looking at investment about a billion mm. for a vaccine or more. And I think that's something, of course, where people take very little risk because simply the financial um, problems could be, could be immense. But I'm completely convinced that synthetic-based vaccines um, can and they will make a huge uh, difference. And if you think about product development cycles of 15 to 20 years, um, I spent about the last uh, 15 years now on this, I would say. So I think we are at a point now where actually things are beginning to change as we see the last seven years now. Yeah. What about the cost of carbohydrate-based vaccines versus protein-based vaccines or other type of vaccines? How are we, how do they compare? Yeah, so a synthetic vaccine, as I said, the carbohydrate will cost you about, I don't know, below 10 cents. Yeah. 
uh, you got to conjugate it, but maybe the same amount. So the cost of goods maybe in the range of like, you know, below 50 cents or something. So it's really not a big deal. Uh, that is something that I would say it's price competitive against isolate um, carbohydrates, where the facilities are much, much more expensive. We should also realize that once I have a developed product in the market, I spend all my money, I probably want to make sure that I see that through its mm. life cycle, because yes, the facility to make a vaccine was maybe 500 million plus to build that. It was oftentimes not that expensive for these big vaccines, but I've already invested that money. So if I go to a new vaccine that's based on synthetics, I will only do that once I really make sure I got all the money back. Really, I mean, that is why these life cycles are, are so long. So I don't think it's really a scientific issue that we're talking about now anymore. We're talking much more about economic issues yeah. and sort of those, those aspects. Yeah, I guess those issues are though really important to talk about if you think about like the application of it and whether it's actually going to be applied. Um, and I was also just wondering whether the process, like I guess making the monosaccharides is still a lengthy process. I guess we can buy a lot of them now. Um, and I guess pharmaceutical companies would be buying most of the monosaccharides, right? And then they could use your machine to put them together. So actually like time-wise, um, making carbohydrate-based vaccines will not take that much longer than making like a protein-based no, vaccine. Faster. It's actually faster in many cases nowadays because yeah. it works quite well. What's interesting is when we go for new projects, so just to give you a little bit something what's going on right now, we look at a particular pathogen that's in the mouth. There are some aspects that people believe it's connected um, it's connected to certain autoimmune diseases, including possibly Alzheimer. And uh, one of my students was able very, very quickly to assemble all the oligosaccharides and start them with some of this um, research. And typically from the start of a project uh, to getting the first results, you're looking at between three months and a year at most. Yeah. Uh, and those are in totally new areas. And I think that's the other area that we are seeing uh, from a basic research standpoint, very interesting results um, that together with colleagues in Basel, um, we showed that um, in multiple sclerosis patients, we found antibodies against carbohydrates in the cerebral spinal fluid. So basically yeah. in your nerve system, you start seeing antibodies against carbohydrates, carbohydrates that are typically on the surface of bacteria in your gut. So for some reason, people make antibodies against bacteria in the gut, and those antibodies show up in places they shouldn't be, namely the cerebral spinal fluid. And we have now broadened that with these colleagues' the initial papers, 2020, uh, science and uh, immunology, and uh, we are fin we're finding this now in a much broader sense. So that would suggest that some people um, make antibodies against these bacteria, and it's not clear yet that either every all of us make it, yeah. but they don't get a cerebral spinal fluid, or some, and in some cases it just goes to a cerebral spinal fluid. So this is what we are trying to see now, but there's a clear correlation between some autoimmune diseases and the presence of antibodies against carbohydrates. So that would be opposite, that not the normal vaccine, but now these are things that have to do with disease. And that's another area that's now developing um, very, very nicely that we like to understand. And this could go in two directions. You may have antibodies yeah. against cancer cells, which protect you. It could be antibodies against bacteria, which maybe want to protect yourself, and all of a sudden they react with self. So you're getting this problem of, of adhesion to self, and that leads to autoimmune disease. So what we are realizing now in my lab is that we made these tools we create all these tools, we, we use the tools now, and all of a sudden, maybe if, once you have a hammer, maybe everything looks like a nail, you're looking at these things, and you all of a sudden realize, okay, there's immunology, there are open questions, autoimmune disease, cancer, and what I like to do is just trying to get more people to say, okay, look guys, there is something interesting, don't just dismiss carbohydrates, because people don't think about carbohydrates, you may eat them, but beyond yeah. that, there's very little interest, right? And it's like, look, I mean, there's all this stuff, there's all these tools that we didn't have five years ago, 10 years ago, we have them now, and maybe the people who are really hardcore medical people, biologists, should be in this area. And today, I work with a lot of um, clinicians, a lot of um, yeah, well, experts in those areas, where we bring the tools, they bring the knowledge of the disease area, and then together we do that. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the reasons why I really also am pushing the commercial aspects, because if you can make the tools, it can't be just that a Max Planck crew like mine just makes the tools, right? It's gonna be somewhere where people don't have to put authors on paper or something that we're actually just gonna go, pay money, get something, and then go on to the research. And if you look back at the uh, impact of automated synthesis, um, I think my PhD advisor, for example, Carabers, a hardcore chemist, if you will, um, is very often not recognized because people think like, okay, my primer comes from FedEx because I sent an email and then my primer, DNA primer just comes yeah. by FedEx, right? Yeah. Um, little do people realize that to make a Gene in 1970 was um, a series of papers 
that was 300 pages of research papers. And today, all we would do is just send an email to a company, and in two days, or if it takes a long next, maybe tomorrow, we get we get that gene made. It yeah. would cost us something like 70 euros or something at most, right? And I think um, this is where we like to get to, where basically uh, we take the chemical effort, make it look so easy that anybody can do it. But we should always remember, by the end of the day, a lot of chemistry went into that. And, and I think that's what people often forget, and people that have done these things, for example, would be no polymerase chain reaction for primers. Mm -hmm. And so I think yeah. uh, Carabras, in my mind, is one of the overlooked people, because without his achievement, no primers would be just no molecular biology. And yeah. I think chemists oftentimes don't do a very good job in, in showing that, that chemistry can be important and often it's, it's only then the, the secondary effects that sort of show the importance of chemistry. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the importance of chemistry, it, it's so hard in society. Society hates chemists. It's, uh, it's hard because... I think right now that's changing slightly because we realize that without chemistry it's very difficult to live, right? I think yeah. once you realize it only once you don't have it anymore at some point. And I think with, I think if we talk about chemistry, we talk about uh, Pistaritz, the company that in, in East Germany here that makes um, fertilizer usually. Mm -hmm. uh, they make it from Russian gas. Uh, they don't have a Russian gas anymore. They don't make fertilizer. Okay. They don't make fertilizer. There's no CO2, right? It's one of the byproducts which we use for breweries and lemonade making and all other things. Um, but there's also no urea. And of course, you all produce urea, right? But we also need urea because we need to put that in our if you're a diesel car. You need this, what's called AdBlue. And yeah. today, because they don't make the fertilizer anymore, they don't make AdBlue. If you don't make AdBlue, you can run the cars. And so I think today we are realizing that chemistry is at the basis of most of the things we do. The German chemical industry in Germany, US, China is very, very strong. Yeah. But if we eliminate that, then uh, we'll have a problem. And I think chemists have done another great job the last uh, 100 years in, 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 in making sure what they do is actually important. And yes, lots of environmental problems, lots of issues have existed. They need to be addressed, right? We need to totally change our chemistry. Um, but I think um, as chemists, we need to make a little more clear why this, what we do is important mm. for society. Yeah, yeah. You've talked a lot about startups. Uh, it seems like you have 20 gazillion startups. <laughs> not, not 20 gazillion, but nine actually, yeah. So we did nine uh, successful startups. So a couple more that uh, sort of stayed small and didn't really make it. Um, yeah. Yeah, so how hard was it to always start these start? It seems like whenever you have like a good idea, you would just, you know, Go for it. And uh, so I never wanted to start a company, I should say that, okay? Okay. Um, the whole thing started at MIT with our first company in 2001. Uh, that time we did automated synthesis and um, at MIT we always look at the patentability of things and they said, well, you know, that actually is pretty interesting. That could work for automated synthesis. So why don't you patent that? So we patented it and then they sort of suggested to participate in MIT 50, at that time it was 50K, I think today it's more. So $50,000 uh, is what you could get for winning the business plan contest. And my first PhD student said, oh, why don't we enter the business plan contest? And one of my neighbors was a business guy, but a chemist originally. And so they brought a PhD student, we applied and we won the MIT 50K business plan contest. And they started a company which we sold after 12 years when it was quite successful in the US. And um, then we started another company at MIT because some colleagues said, oh, well, you're making this useful in a different, different area. And so typically I was always interested in research and we found something and then people would say, oh, can we get that? And I was like, well, you know, I, I can't give it to you because I'm just an academic, right? And then once I realized once there's a market, then you can address that market. And then this is when we start companies. But it was never done where we said, okay, we, we want to do this. I think seeing it now, I realized that so much in academic research uh, could be useful to people. Of course, it depends on the area. I work in this yeah. area between chemistry and medicine, so that's a little easier. But uh, I think people should just keep an open mind and say, okay, if there are people willing to pay money for a product, then maybe one should try to make that product available because by the end of the day, that's good for economy, that's good for our society, and it's also good for all people that, that finish with us, right? So many yeah. of my students create their own jobs uh, yeah. afterwards, and uh, they got to stay, for example, in Berlin, right? And there were not so many other job choices at some point. And by them, for example, creating Vaxlon, but today I'm not sure how many people have now in Berlin, but it, it's tens of, of high paying PhD jobs. Well, they got to stay in Berlin and they live in a nice place and, and work on the chemistry they mm -hmm. like. So I think that's really nice. And, uh, but again, it was never that I said, okay, we have to start companies or any of that stuff. That was never the idea. But I would encourage everybody, uh, if they think there is a use out of what they do out of their science and there's an application and people are willing to, by the end of the day, even pay for this application because there's a value created, uh, I think they can move this forward. And uh, of course, you have pitfalls, and the first time you do it, you learn a lot, and the tenth time you do it, there's a few less mistakes you make, as they mm -hmm. make mistakes all the time. But I think, like everything else in life, 
certain things just get a lot easier uh, with time and by the end of the day it depends on who you know and I think once you've done it a few times you know who to work yeah. with and who to talk to just like in science. Yeah, 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 have any of your startups ever failed? Of course. Of course. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, of course, no, no, I think, uh, I think uh, we have had things where we had good idea. One, I can tell you, we developed a process uh, here at Max Planck uh, to make um, efavirenz. It's an HIV compound, anti-HIV compound. And we developed a uh, process to make it much, much easier by flow chemistry. Um, it's a drug that's used in South Africa in immense amounts. Okay. And when we published a paper in Angewandte Chemie, we got phone calls from South Africa, people saying, look, we would like to use that to make it ourselves. And uh, we, because of the well, long-winded discussions, um, we started a company and financed a little bit into it. And the market for South Africa was huge. We are buying the drug today from India and China at high prices. And we had negotiations in South Africa. And the run was dropping, while we were speaking, the run was dropping by 8%, which means at that moment, the two hours yeah. of discussion, the drug for, uh, price for the drugs just went up by 8%. So if they could make it in, in South Africa, in their own country, they could A, create jobs in South Africa, yeah. they could make their own drug supply, would not be reliant on other people anymore, and it would be independent of, of, um, of, of currency fluctuation, for example. Um, technically, this would have made a lot of sense. It would have made a lot of sense for South Africa. We would have made next to no money or little, it's not about that, it was trying to, to help somebody, yeah. right? Um, and it was mainly, I would say, for interesting political and economic reasons. Yeah. That's why people felt it was better to spend a lot of money buying this from Asia than making it um, in South Africa. That made me quite sad because yeah. it was sort of one of those things I felt like it would have been the right thing for them to do in their own country. Yeah. Um, but by the end of the day, okay, we started the company, eventually we just closed it down. Right, just closed it down. Yeah, we lost some money, but that's okay. I mean, I yeah. think it would have been the right thing, but luckily that's sort of was the exception. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about the um, automated synthesis um, for making the carbohydrates, yeah. putting the building blocks together? Is that being used in companies right now? So um, the company is actually just across where we meet right now, the street from oh. here. So there's a company like Universe uh, that is actually also employs a number of my own students. They've been around um, for nine years, now almost 10 years. And they, have very hard, they had very, very hard times at some point. Uh, the synthesizers they sell are not cheap, but they are all, mm. around, all around the world, actually, in the Northern Hemisphere. Yeah. Um, they are just coming out of a new prototype, uh, actually a new synthesizer now. The prototype was, was again developed um, at Max Planck, um, but um, they have a new generation now of these synthesizers, and I think they have already five or six uh, pre-orders of wow. what's going to be sold. And the good thing is, like everything, they got smaller, they got four times faster and they got cheaper. So that's a good thing. So actually, yeah, the yeah. price is coming down, so more people are buying it. And um, I think by the end of the day, that's really what's needed because people want to have ready access uh, to those sorts of systems. And that's why I'm happy with my students do this because if they can yeah. um, make things accessible, it makes our life better. Yeah, yeah. so they're just constantly improving the, the automated synthesis. Yeah, so I think that, exactly. And actually, they will also, um, we will also buy one of the synthesizers for them because they have no yeah. synthesizers that are better than our own. Uh, because yeah. Max Planck, we are not really in the process of, of building commercial no. systems, right? Yeah. I think that to us was, was one of the good things as well. And I, I think it just shows shows sort of uh, the strengths of industry, right? Industry is yeah. really good at doing some things and we are good at doing basic Yeah, things. yeah, definitely. But then is it like mainly chemical engineers working there or chemists? Well, they have mainly chemists where they've worked with chemical wow. engineers in the past. Uh, they are companies that build the instruments. They don't necessarily build things, right? I think that is something we outsource. Uh, yeah. But again, they, the, the synthesizers are all built in Germany. So, okay. so it's actually interesting because it shows you also how these things are connected and how uh, this uh, filters out. The issue for these instrumentation companies is that when you develop a new instrument, it's a lot of money to develop a new instrument. Yeah. And you can't really charge that much money because the numbers are relatively low. So I think the first synthesizer, they sold like 12 of them. And now the new synthesizer, because it's a little less expensive and the technology is much further, now all of a sudden things are going much, much faster. So they sold, I think, the last few months, six of them. Yeah. So that's that's good to know. And of course, for us, what we want, we want our technology out there. Of course, scientifically now, it's much more competition than I had a few years ago, but that's what we want, right? Because we develop a field and we want others to join in the field and they will only join if they can come in and there's one pharmaceutical company that bought the synthesizer, a large vaccine company, I can't mention any names, no, no. they're using it in-house. I don't know what they do with it, but yeah. I know they, I think they had it for two years now. And they're using it and we're getting now more people asking actually questions and that shows me, okay, People are interested in yeah. the other thing that's important is between a company and me, there's a firewall. So I don't really know exactly what other people do with that because, of course, I think these pharmaceutical companies would not be necessarily happy if I would know exactly what they're working on. I think that's, yeah. that's, I think that's important. Do you see, do you think that the machine's going to improve 
a lot in the upcoming years? It's like every phone you have, right? I think there'll be, I think this one to the one we had beforehand, the last one was released, I think, in 2014, 2015. Ah. So we had like seven years. Uh, the new machine, I guess, is a quarter of a weight. Yeah. It, it takes a quarter of the energy, which is good. Yeah. Um, it's not It's not a quarter of the price, but it's cheaper. Um, <laughs> but it's four times faster. So I mean, yeah, everybody wishes, right? But I think eventually it has the potential to become a lot cheaper. And what we see is, I think we're going to see more incremental developments. But eventually, as you get the higher numbers, uh, that's when the price yeah. uh, will come exactly, down. Exactly. Right. Like you said right. before, if more people start using it, the price will go down. Right. Yeah. And the good thing for us is that, I mean, for me, it's like because this company is not something that primarily, of course, you can make money for the investors and so on for them, right? But the same for me as an academic, it's I just want to see you succeed because that means that the technology developed in Max Planck will be used by other people. Yeah, yeah. Do you see the field of carbohydrate vaccine chemistry growing dramatically? Or are there just still like a lot of hurdles we need to overcome? And so then we're kind of only going to see the field growing in like 20, 30 years time. No, I think we're seeing it uh, growing right now. So the interaction with the vaccine companies, things are moving forward. But what I also see is the antibody companies coming now uh, forward because other technologies are coming together. And I think the glyco field overall is uh, drastically increasing. Yeah. So I think the glyco sciences, so carbohydrate chemistry, glycobiology, these were areas that were really underdeveloped. And the interesting thing is there was a group originally coming from the United States and people like me also involved um, that brought a textbook because you actually need textbooks because people couldn't even train this area. Nobody knew about glycobiology. And I talked to many biologists who told me, look, when we do research, we get a protein, okay, we know we can do that. We get any sort of molecular biology, we can do it. The moment a carbohydrate is involved, we don't touch it anymore. Because there are no tools, we have few experts, it's a pain in the neck, we just want to do it. Yeah. And really my goal was to say, okay, let's move it forward. I think vaccines are sort of showing that because people in companies said, okay, the field's not very developed, there's not too many scientists, so let's not touch it. I think that's now gone, and I think that's why people say, okay, we can now move it. I, I see the vaccine field things actually moving quite quickly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, very nice. Um, and if with your research group now, so you have the two, one automated um, research group and the other one that's working on carbohydrate-based vaccines. What do the other research groups? So uh, the way I run my department is maybe slightly different from other places because Max Planck, we have freedom to do that. Yeah. Um, originally I said, okay, I've got to run those two core areas and I hire people that are experts in other areas. They come as group leaders, they get to stay until they get another job, they get no permanent contracts. And um, so far out of my group, we have brought out 68 professors. Um, not all from the group leaders, from, from PhDs and postdocs, of course, uh, but the group leaders usually stay here between, I would say, four years and, and eight years before we move on to academic jobs typically. Um, and I hire people that are experts in other areas. So, in the original batch of people here, we had somebody who did the secrets carbohydrates. Okay. Um, right now, uh, Felix Löffler, he um, is an engineer um, and um, he basically develops systems where he can make massive paralyzed synthesis using surface chemistry. Uh, Martina Bianco, she works on material science based on carbohydrates. So they work on things that are still sort of in the theme of the department, yeah. but um, maybe doing something totally different. John Malloy, for example, he is a hardcore synthetic chemist, works in catalysis, but he works on aspects that are interesting to also flow chemistry, which is another aspect of my research here. Dario Cambier works on flow chemistry. So we have people that are sort of related, but not exactly in my field. And the idea is really for people to be close enough to work with the department, but far enough away from me so that when they apply for jobs somewhere, but somebody says, oh, this is just Seaburger 2.0, same sort of thing. Yeah. It is always very important, I think, that they build their own brand as research group leaders, such that when I go for academic positions, it's very, very clear, okay, this person did that, and that is their brand, and that is why we should hire them. And it's not just, oh, Seaburger, just give them good ideas, and, and they just execute, right? Yeah. I think they have to have this level of independence, and my job is to mentor them, make sure that they they really um, go out and, 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 and develop as people and uh, develop their own program. And I think what we need to do is basically we need to try to A, be good scientists, but well, usually not good anyway. Yeah. Um, um, build groups, which means we also have to raise money. Do teaching, so I encourage them very strongly to do teaching here. I have a FU Berlin, TU Berlin, or in Potsdam. Uh, because by the end of the day, I think uh, coming out of Max Planck, they got fantastic opportunities. But if you don't know how to teach, I think it's very difficult to become a professor because that's your mm. job, you gotta teach, right? Um, yeah. You don't like that, and maybe it's not a job for you. Um, and I think this has worked out quite nicely for us because um, 
I think we're very open about this. You tell people you can work your own independent thing. It's maybe not quite so convenient because I expect you to write grant applications and raise <laughs> your own money. Um, but I think that's what we need as a professor as well. And I think uh, the sooner you learn that, uh, the better. And so the whole department is really built on a quite flat hierarchy, I would say, right? As me as a director and with two groups, but the, uh, the group leaders here have, um, for the most part, complete um, independence in those areas. Sometimes it starts a little less independent in the beginning, but then they, they move out into ideas. But they have, nice. to, have to be independent afterwards. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much for thank this you. really interesting conversation. Yeah, thank you. That's it. Thank you all so much for listening. If you would like to learn more about Professor Zabaga's research, you can check out his website on the MPI of Colloids and Interfaces website. And you can also follow him on Twitter. And if you like our podcasts, make sure to follow us on our Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram page. Thanks again for listening. Bye. Osterman Magazine, the podcast is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD Net Science Communication Group known as the Osterman Magazine. The intro outro music is composed by Serena Brankumar, and the pre-intro jingle is composed by Gustavo Carrizzo. If you have any feedback, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to write us at offspring.podcasts at phdnet.mpg.de. Until next week, stay safe, stay healthy. Bye.